It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Speaker, it's um, the case that we've seen almost 4,000 people lose their lives to COVID-19 in long-term care. So my first question is to the Premier. Does the Premier believe that he did everything he could to save people's lives in long-term care? The Premier. Well, through you, through you, Mr. Speaker, the, the science table just came out and told, told everyone in Canada how many lives we, we did save. And that, that's so important. Uh, and through them, you know, the, the table showed the residents of long-term care not only being prioritized in phase one rollout, the vaccine of 2,079 more infections could have occurred if we didn't do that, of which 249 have resulted in hospitalizations and, and 1,615 deaths if we didn't uh, go in there immediately to vaccinate uh, all the uh, folks in, in long-term care. So. Uh, not, not only did we throw everything we had at it, but so did all the doctors, the PSWs, uh, hospitals, everyone uh, went full steam ahead, and uh, we did everything in our powers to make sure we protected the long-term care residents. And the supplementary question. Well, Sister, uh, Speaker, in fact, there's uh, new evidence that uh, was unveiled uh, last night from the testimony at the Long-Term Care Commission, uh, and I'm going to speak to it uh, right now. The uh, testimony of Dr. Alison McGeer, a very well-respected public health expert who sits on the science table, when asked uh, in response to a question from the uh, Commission about why the second wave was worse in long-term care than the first wave, said this. In the lead-up to the second wave, a number of proposals went to the ministry about what, what could be done, and all of them were deemed by the ministry to be too expensive. They were deemed by the government to be too expensive. More seniors died in the second wave than in the first wave, Speaker. Why did this Premier choose saving money over saving lives? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. I, I refute uh, the, the premise of that question. Our government has taken every action possible, uh, even up to uh, making sure that uh, we address the long-standing issues in long-term care left behind by the previous government. $1.38 billion has gone to our, our long-term care sector to shore it up. Uh, we were able to hire 8,600, over 8,600 people during first wave using the pandemic pay. We used the surveillance testing uh, when it was available available to us. Uh, we used the rapid testing when it was available to us. Uh, we uh, established the specialized care center. We deployed staff from hospitals to address the longstanding uh, and emergency staffing issue. We had an integrated response with Public Health Ontario, uh, the hospitals, uh, public health. This has been a, a integrated response. Uh, and, and I want to say this issue was long-standing, and when COVID-19 hit, we used every measure possible. There was no expense spared, and I can, I'm absolutely confident of that. Thank you. And the final well, Speaker, one year ago, the Premier said this, and I quote, it's just repeated unbelievably by the Minister for Long-Term Care, no expense will be spared. We will consider every option to support those Ontarians in need during this crisis. Dr. McGeer testified the exact opposite. Options were ignored. 4,000 people lost their lives, almost, in long-term care because the Ford government didn't spend, want to spend the money. So while the Premier was watching people die in long-term care and families were mourning the loss of their loved ones, why did he still decide not to spend the money to save those seniors' lives? Members, please take their seats. Minister of Long Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. I absolutely reject that mischaracterization of the actions of this government as a minister. Yeah. I'm going to ask the minister to withdraw. I'll withdraw. As the Minister of Long Term Care, I can tell you no expense was spared. Everything we did 
was in response to a, a crisis of staffing, a crisis of capacity, overcoming order. the structural inadequacies Leader, the left behind by the previous government. $1.38 billion uh, for COVID response alone, $1.9 billion in the works to make sure that we have on an annual basis the staffing that's required, making sure that we address the staffing shortage both on an emergency level, on a stabilization level, and a long-term care, uh, uh, long-term issue uh, with the staffing. And 8,000, over 8,000 staff were hired uh, with the pandemic pay to stabilize this sector. Our government used rapid tests that hadn't, that had to be approved by Health Canada. Were there delays with approvals? Were there delays getting back? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my next question is also for the Premier, but I have to say uh, I'm astounded uh, that this government is responding in this way when we know the pain and anguish that family members, the worry, the fear that they had for their loved ones in long-term care as they watched the second wave come upon us. Here's what Dr. McGeer said. In the lead-up to the second wave, and I quote, Quebec hired a large number of additional staff. That would be in the summer, last summer, not like a month ago or a week ago. We chose not to do that in Ontario. Quebec hired 10,000 PSWs. Experts did say that that saved lives. The Premier could have saved lives by spending the money to staff up last summer. Why didn't he spend the money to staff up and save the lives of vulnerable seniors in long-term care? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, it's it's very clear that there are there's information missing from the narrative uh, across the the chamber. Our government, with its pandemic pay and the emergency and stabilization process that we used, which albeit different from Quebec's, uh, we achieved 8,636 hires during that time. We stabilized the sector. We worked desperately and frantically around the clock. Many many people people working to stabilize this. And I want to clarify, on, uh, Quebec did not hire 10,000 PSWs. They trained orderlies in three, in three months, in 12 weeks. They did not create 10,000 PSW positions. They did not hire 10,000 PSWs. They hired orderlies and got to about half the amount, of which many of those wanted to leave. Response. We need a process by which we create a better place to live and a better place to work, and that's exactly Exactly what we're doing in long-term care after years of neglect. Thank you. The supplementary question. Here, I'll tell you what's missing here in Ontario. What's missing is the iron ring that the Premier promised around long-term care. But there's an iron ring around the Premier. There's an iron ring around the Premier when it comes to answering questions. Here's what Dr. McGeer said. Dr. Stahl, and I quote, Dr. Stahl and Dr. Brown also put forward a number of proposals for trying to empty out the four bedrooms so that we didn't have three or four residents in a room throughout the second wave. There was no hope that anything that cost that amount of money was going to be undertaken. The minister, at the same time in this legislature, was saying, and I quote, we're using every possible measure when responding to my colleague uh, from Temiskaming uh, in, in his questions and question period. So my question to the Premier again is, why won't the Premier admit that as he watched question. people dying in long-term care, he still couldn't bring himself to spend the money to save their lives? Members will please take their seats. The Premier to reply. Who are you, Mr. Speaker? The only person that was missing and missing and missing was the Leader of the Opposition. There's nowhere to be found. Disappeared for a year. Did absolutely sure. nothing for people in long-term care. Did nothing for the people of Ontario as we were working our backs off 24-7 as she was Shangri-La in somewhere. Don't ask me where, but there was nowhere to be found with the Leader of the Opposition. It's easy to sit here and play the armchair quarterback as we were making sure that we accelerated the order. build program by 30,000 thousand beds, Mr. Order. Speaker. Can I continue, Mr. Speaker? 
Opposition, come to order. Please conclude your response, Premier. As our government has approved nearly over two billion, two billion, never been approved before in the history of this province, two billion dollars in staffing up to 27,000 people. Response. We've already hired, and we're on the process of hiring 8,600, as the minister mentioned. We are all over this. But again, Mr. Speaker, where was the leader of the opposition? Thank you. Please, please take your seat. Final supplementary. Imagine how those families are feeling today. Imagine the pain and the anguish that they're feeling knowing that their government didn't spend the money necessary to keep their loved ones safe. It is absolutely side, horrifying. Will this Premier now admit that, in fact, there was much more that he should have done. There was much more that he could have done to prevent the pain, Order. the anguish, the horrors that families face, thousands of families, as 4,000 people lost their lives to COVID-19 when the Premier didn't want to spend the money to save them. And the Premier to reply. Mr. Speaker. The researchers, because you always want to quote doctors, I'll start quoting doctors as well, researchers estimate that there was roughly 90% reduction in cases among residents and nearly 80% reduction in staff eight weeks after the vaccinations began in December the 14th. Order. Pro pri prioritizing the vaccination of long-term care home residents was highly efficient, resolving uh, the province's most tragic problem during the pandemic, said Dr. Peter Juni, scientific director the of the provincial government. COVID advisory table. So I'm sure when you have an advisory table, uh, leader of the opposition, you have different points of view. We're taking this point of view that we've done everything in our powers. And on top of it, when you're doing it, you're insulting the doctors, you're insulting the DSW. Okay. The leader of the opposition will come to order. Thank you. Oh. I'm going to ask the Premier to withdraw. Withdraw. The next question. Member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last night, the Ford government secretly, quietly signed six new minister zoning orders behind closed doors. We've had a look, and once again, prominent PC donors are among the people who stand to benefit. An NDP analysis previously shows that at least 19, 19 of this government's previous MZOs benefit PC party donors and insiders. Why is this government using MZOs to bulldoze wetlands and green spaces to let its buddies make more money? Premier. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, you know, so, so many different governments, including the previous government, government would hide MZOs. We're proud to announce that we have MZOs because it's about the economy. Once we get through this, Mr. Speaker, people are going to be looking for jobs. And we can't wait four years. And by the way, Mr. Speaker, we only sign an MZO once we get a letter from the mayor of the region or the chair of the region, the mayor of the city and council. Once it gets approved, it's an ask by them. We don't go into towns and all of a sudden just issue MZOs. It's an ask from each region and each city. And I want more MZOs to stir the economy, to get jobs out there, because the leader of the opposition, they don't worry about jobs. They're, they all get their big fat paychecks, Mr. Speaker. They don't worry about the hard work and working class folks. Spons? We do. Supplementary question. Thank you. Um, I want to point out to the Premier that municipalities have said that this decision making process is being done under duress. Uh, and you are authorizing the destruction of wetlands under the cover of COVID. This government has used MZOs more than any other government in the province's history. Come inside, come to order. They're doing it not for the benefit of the people. It appears like they're doing it to help their friends make more money. Big donors like Flato Developments are getting priority status thanks to this government's decision to quietly sign a whopping six new MZOs late last night. Why is this government putting money and politics ahead of the province and our environment? Before I invite the Premier to reply, I'll remind the members that the standing orders prohibit imputing motive. I'm going to ask the member for Waterloo to withdraw. Withdraw. And the Premier now to reply to the issue that was raised. Mr. Speaker. They say one thing, and then they say another. They flip-flop back and forth, 
And my issue with that, Mr. Speaker, is right now we're building four rapid long-term care facilities to make sure that we have the beds that long-term care patients need. Mr. Speaker, I guess everyone in this room has heard the escalating cost in housing. It's no longer just young people can't afford housing, it's everyone. And something that they don't understand is something called supply and demand. We want more houses out there, more condominiums, more townhouses to make sure that people can afford it. You put a greater supply, what happens? A huge supply, the number starts flattening out. The cost of it make it more affordable. We will never stop issuing MZOs for the people of Ontario, the people that need housing. What? There's 40,000 people moving in the GTA, fastest growing region in North America. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? If it's up Opposition to them, they'd to be order. living in mud huts right now. They wouldn't be building. Thank you. Thank you. The, the next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Well, thank you, Speaker, and uh, my question is Order. To, uh, my question is to the Minister of Health. With each passing day, there seems to be obviously more light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to COVID-19, whether it be more vaccines being approved or an increase in shipments of the Pfizer vaccine. Ontarians have good reason to feel more hopeful with each passing day. I will say my uh, constituents are anxious to get their COVID-19 vaccine, and I know we're working around the clock to make sure they get that. We have the most effective vaccination campaign in the country. My question, Speaker, would the minister please provide an update to this House on the progress of our province's COVID-19, uh, the vaccine rollout? Thank you. Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Haldeman and Norfolk for your question. Our government has said from the beginning that we are committed to having one of the most effective immunization campaigns in the country, and we are well on our way to achieving that goal. By the end of this week, we will have administered over 1 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine to eligible Ontarians all across our province. This early success is yet another sign of how effective our government's vaccination plan continues to be as we receive more doses of the vaccine from the federal government. In order to build from this success, we recently announced our second phase of the vaccine rollout. Starting on March 15th, we will be launching an online booking system and a provincial customer service desk to answer questions and support appointment bookings at mass immunization clinics. Clinics. Our government will continue to work with all of our partners around the province to ensure that all Ontarians who want to receive a vaccine will get one. Supplementary question. Well, I, I thank the Minister of Health for that update and that uh, explanation. And, uh, Speaker, my uh, supplementary question is to our Solicitor General. Uh, Solicitor General, in uh, my own riding of Haldeman Norfolk, I do hear from people. And we hear from people from all over the province. They're concerned about our most vulnerable, people living in uh, remote and uh, isolated indigenous communities who oftentimes face a, a disproportionate risk with respect to the virus. Can the minister please provide this house with an update on what's referred to as Operation Remote Immunity? The Solicitor General to reply. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member of Haldeman Norfolk for your interest in this, because it is exciting news, as the Minister of Health said. We've reached a key milestone in protecting remote and isolated Indigenous communities against COVID-19 by visiting all 31 fly-in communities in Northern Ontario and Moosonee to offer first doses for the vaccine as part of Operation Remote Immunity. This important milestone could not have been achieved without the tremendous effort of Indigenous leadership, community members, Orange and frontline healthcare workers coming together to stop the spread of COVID-19 in these fly-in communities. As of March 7, 2021, Operation Remote Immunity has administered 15,324 doses, including 12,661 doses and 2,664 second doses. This truly is a team effort, Speaker, and I am so proud of the work that Operation Remote Immunity has had. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you. To the Premier. The Conservative government's entire 
pandemic response has been to show up kind of a day late and a dollar short. But when it comes to the vaccine rollout, that strategy is causing chaos and confusion across our entire province because the Conservative still cannot get a website online. Cities and towns are left to pick up the slack. They are scrambling to get their own booking system up and running to add to the confusion. We have hospital, family health team, community health centre, also all launching their own uh, sites. We even have website that collects all of the other websites together. Premier, Order. we have been in this crisis for over one full year. Question. Why wasn't that enough time to set up a website? Mr. Paul. Thank you very much, Speaker. We, well, I would say to the member opposite that we do have a plan. We have a website that we'll be launching on March 15th. We want to make sure that it's robust enough to be able to handle the large volume of calls that we know that it will receive. We know that in several other provinces, their websites crashed very early on. We want to make sure that our system will not do so. But what is happening is not at all unexpected and was part of the plan from the beginning, that each of the 34 public health units are going to be responsible for the running of their own plan. There's a central plan, but it's going to look different in each of the 34 public health units because they know the particulars of their own uh, geographic area. So many of them have already started up their own websites. It's anticipated that most of them will then merge into the central website as of March 15th. But some of them will not. They already have websites that are up and running and are serving their own purposes. And I think the fact that we will have administered a million vaccines by the end of this week speaks for itself about the success of this. Thank you. And the supplementary question. I'd like to point out the families in Rexdale, a neighbourhood right in the Premier's own backyard and one of the hard-hit uh, COVID hotspot in this city. They are currently paying the price for the Conservative government struggling with their vaccine rollout. Folks who are over 80 years old are eligible to get vaccinated, but they still have no idea how, where, when are they going to book their appointment. There is still no plans to help people that don't have access to the internet or have language barriers or don't have a mass vaccination close by. How could it be, Speaker? The entire Rexdale area has been described as a no man's land for vaccine by health official. If families in the Premier's own riding cannot get access to COVID-19, I'm asking you, Premier, Question. what is going on? Much. We are committed to making sure that every Ontarian who wants to receive a vaccine in any part of the province is going to receive one. However, it is important to note that Toronto, because of the large volume of people in long-term care homes and frontline health care workers, all of those people that were included in phase one, they still have to finish that. They are not quite ready in every part of Toronto to move into phase two and the vaccination of people over 80 years of age. So this is coming forward. There is going to be the online booking tool as of March 15th. There is to be going to be the customer center that people can call to make an appointment. So we recognize that a lot of people don't have access to the internet, don't feel comfortable making bookings that way. They will be able to do so by phone. And I can also advise that all of the information relating to Spons? bookings, which will become immediately available when they are ready to start doing those vaccinations of over 80 people across the city, have been translated into 59 different languages. So everyone will have access. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ontario is expected to receive AstraZeneca vaccines this week. And the government said last week that they're launching yet another pilot during a pandemic, distributing the AstraZeneca uh, vaccines through pharmacies in three regions. Well, it's Tuesday and the pharmacies haven't been identified and it's unclear as to how we can book an appointment. Now, the Premier said they'll be launching in 500 pharmacies and the Pharmacists Association says, well, it's actually 380 locations. So this is just another important announcement that leaves more questions than answers. And what's most concerning is 114,000 of these doses are set to expire on April the 2nd. So, Speaker, through you, can the Premier confirm when the details Order. of this rollout will be put forward? 
Question. and assure Ontarians that none of this AstraZeneca vaccine will be wasted. The Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. And yes, I can assure the member that these vaccinations, vaccines will not be wasted. There is a central plan. There are going to be distributed in three locations in Toronto, uh, uh, Windsor, Essex, and in the uh, Kingston area because of the fact that the 190,000 vaccines that we are expecting to receive today, as a matter of fact, a day earlier, are time limited. You're absolutely right. and We want to make sure that they can be delivered quickly and efficiently through the over 300 pharmacies that have been identified. This list should be available tomorrow. It is uh, because there are some agreements with the individual pharmacies that have yet to be finally signed that we are finalizing, but if the, uh, the ones that aren't signing right now haven't been done, we will find another 20 or 30 um, pharmacies that will be able to deliver it. But this plan Response. is ready to go, and we'll be receiving um, applications and online um, bookings as of Friday to start the, uh, the work on these vaccines to ensure that they are. Thank you. <laughs> the supplementary. Speaker, it always seems like we're weeks behind other provinces. You know, the Premier said in November when vaccines arrive, we'll be ready. Here's what happened. The government took a vaccine holiday over Christmas. Then they took Order. nearly 60 days and Minister half a million doses environment to get to the 70,000 residents of long-term care. The first dose to them, the people we said we had to get to first. Imagine they were two weeks behind other provinces. Imagine if vaccines had got to Roberta Place two weeks earlier. So the central line online Minister booking system, well, it wasn't ready at the beginning of March, like other provinces. And then the head of the vaccine task force says your doctor is going to be calling you. Member for Flamborough will come was, to order. Nobody told the doctors, and now there's a pharmacy pilot with almost no details. I just don't know why we didn't, why we weren't ready. I'm trying to understand Question. why we're not ready, and we're always playing catch up. It's frustrating for Ontarians. You know, by any objective measure, we're not ready. So, Speaker, through you. For I heard the minister say, can you ensure that the doses of the Thank you. Thank you. Order. The House will come to order. The member for Ottawa South will take a seat. Minister of Health to reply. Thank you very much, Speaker. Well, I can assure the member that we do have a plan, that the plan is rolling out as it was intended to. We will be ready. We have been ready to receive the AstraZeneca vaccines. We will be able to deliver them before their expiry, and we can uh, quadruple the number of uh, vaccinations that we're doing per day in very short order. But what we need are the large doses of the vaccines to come in. Yeah. We know that we're going to be receiving larger doses of, of Pfizer. We're receiving Moderna. We're receiving receiving AstraZeneca, and we are ready to deliver them. As a matter of fact, I was at a mass vaccination clinic yesterday in Scarborough with the Premier. They are processing several thousand people per day, but they can double, triple, quadruple as they need to. So we are ready. As soon as we get those large doses of vaccines in, we will be getting them into people's arms as quickly as we can, yeah. which means the day after we receive them. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. The Minister of Infrastructure, as the Minister will know, Ontario is a vast province. We're home to uh, a number of urban areas, both large and small, northern regions, beautiful lakes, and of course, sprawling rural areas. Minister, as someone who represents one of those rural areas, I can tell you the peace and tranquility found in rural small town Ontario comes with a price. It comes with a downside. Many of the services like internet that people in the cities take for granted just are not available in rural areas. Without access to adequate broadband and internet services, many people who live and work in rural Ontario are at a disadvantage. They can't compete. Minister, ensuring access to broadband right across the province will create a level playing field for Ontario businesses, including those living and operating in rural areas. Participating in the digital economy is vital to the continued Question. success. Many people uh, are suffering because of unreliable service. Minister, as we move forward in the digital economy, what can we do to ensure that Thank you. Thank you very much. The Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Haldeman Norfolk for his question and his advocacy for his constituents. And he is quite right. Ontario farmers, like so many people living in our province, will benefit from the steps our government has taken to improve broadband service to the many unserved and underserved communities across Ontario. 
Almost immediately upon being named Minister of Infrastructure, I began to take immediate action to help close the digital divide. Beginning with the release of the Up to Speed, our broadband and cellular action plan, and then quickly followed up by making investments to accelerate expansion of broadband projects right across the province. In the provincial budget presented last fall, we continued our positive steps forward by announcing historic investments in broadband infrastructure. And today, we have legislation beginning debate in this House that, if passed, Response. will help us bridge the digital divide. We're taking action to remove barriers, and I expect we'll have broad support in the House for our broadband legislation, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Minister, for what you've done so far to help ensure rural Ontario is able to get connected. And uh, I'd like to, um, to read a portion of a letter I received from Bob. He's a resident of Haldimand County, and I quote, Dear MPP Barrett, like so many other residents of rural Ontario, we've been able to enjoy a better quality of life thanks to the many technological advancements of the past number of years. The internet has opened up an entire new way of doing business. I can monitor stock remotely. I can reach new customers who are located hundreds of miles away. I can process orders quickly, track my shipments, and ensure that they are delivered to my customer's door on time. However, ensuring this happens smoothly only works with reliable broadband signals. As in many rural communities like question. mine, we simply don't have adequate reliable service. So my question again to you, Minister, Aside from the steps you've taken to improve access to reliable high-speed internet, what else can be done to get our rural communities connected? Minister Van Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for his supplementary question. I want to say to this House that I understand the difficulties people in unserved and underserved areas experience, like Bob. I live them too. And that's why, even though broadband is a federally regulated uh, telecommunications, Ontario has not waited for the federal government to take action. We were making historic investments to improve internet service in Ontario communities that currently lack adequate service. We've introduced legislation that, if passed, will remove barriers to help build infrastructure faster, strengthen our rural communities, and lay the foundation for growth and renewal. We will also continue to, co to call upon the federal government to properly fund broadband not just in Ontario, but across the country. Mr. Speaker, though you, Spons? I'd like to call on all members of the House to support Bill 257 and to work with us to ensure that every Ontarian, regardless of where they live, can participate in the digital economy. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Education. Speaker, the reality of the pandemic and this government's weak plan has had serious consequences for students with complex needs and their families. That includes families at the Beverly School here in Toronto who are worried that their children are falling behind developmentally after a year of disruptions to the daily supports and the therapies they receive at that school. The minister will recall that a variant case shut down classes in late February, and parents told the Globe and Mail this weekend that without regular testing and a plan to vaccinate staff, they expect these disruptions and closures are going to continue. Can the minister tell the House what steps he's taking to mitigate these impacts on students with complex needs and why families are still waiting in March for a comprehensive asymptomatic testing plan? The Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, one of the great feedback we've heard from the development of disability community was that they often felt ignored in government decision-making processes. The disproportionate impact of the pandemic on those parents was heard by this government when we decided, with the support of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, to allow the most exceptional children back into our schools in January. And which political party supported us in this House? Not one. The member opposite and her, her party and the Liberals criticized them. In fact, I had calls from members opposite personally were asking me to rethink the decision based on risk. And when we knew it was the right thing to do for those very children to give them opportunity, access to therapy, and the supports that their parents simply could not provide remotely. That is what our government did. We listened to the science, we listened to parents, we listened to the developmental disability community, and we took action Spons. to ensure they have support, they have access to therapy, and most importantly, the provision of in-class supports, which they deserve. The supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I can assure you, the students at Beverly School and their families don't feel safe right now. And the minister's com comments are just not accurate. Speaker, by Friday, the government's own reporting site showed that only 416 asymptomatic tests had been conducted in Toronto schools over the past seven days. That's the most populous region, the, one of the hottest spots. Across the province, it was just 3,294. We are hearing that only about a quarter of English public and Catholic school boards have a plan in place, and that number is even fewer when you look at Francophone boards. We are nowhere near the 50,000 tests a week that were promised here, and students and families in this province deserve to know why. What could possibly be more important than keeping the children, the most vulnerable children in our province, safe? in their schools. So I'm going to ask again, will the minister please explain why he can't meet his own 50,000 a week target testing? Thank you. Thanks for the education. Mr. Speaker, it is, it is not lost on any member of this House that recalls that the opposition New Democrats and Liberals called on the government to close schools for the most exceptional children in January. They urged us not to reopen. They urged us not to reopen. When, until the state home order was lifted. They have been on the wrong side of this debate order. every step of the way. It is this government, this premier, this party that ensured schools open safely. We have 99 per cent of schools open in this province. We have a program of testing under the leadership of the Ministry of Health, which has ensured 37,000 tests under the age of 17 last week alone. Thousands more in the Ministry of Education program, and in that program, where 563 schools were identified last week, we had a positivity rate Order. of 0.36%, safer than the communities Response. that they operate within. What that demonstrates is our program, informed by the best science, in supported by the Chief Medical Officer of Health, funded by our province, is working to keep schools safe, and we will continue. Next question, the member for Ottawa, Van Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs regarding the use of the ministerial zoning orders. Mr. Speaker, Bill 257 recently introduced includes a small section schedule, schedule tree with potential huge impacts on environment. We've had discussions here in the House very recently about the intended purpose of ministerial zoning orders, which are to accelerate the approval process of necessary projects when it is considered a priority for the well-being of Ontarians. The overwhelming use of such MZOs by the minister over the past year has raised concern and criticism because non-urgent projects were fast-tracked without the benefit of consultations regarding the impact on our environment. And now the government is moving to invalidate any potential for oversight with Bill 257 making these MZOs MZO's final decisions Question. without the possibility of appeal. How can we trust the government not to use their proposed full discretionary power to their own benefit with no regard for the environment? The government Ice Leader to reply. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for, uh, for the question. Uh, the, the Premier, as the Premier said uh, earlier today, uh, MZOs are a very uh, important tool in helping us build a very important infrastructure, uh, infrastructure that includes long-term care homes, uh, hospitals, uh, Mr. Speaker. I know the NDP raised uh, a concern about it earlier. I, I note that one of the MZOs supported affordable housing and the leader of the official opposition's uh, uh, own riding, Mr. Speaker. So we are going to continue to ensure that uh, this very, very necessary infrastructure infrastructure that supports our economic recovery uh, and infrastructure that supports the very important needs in communities. Uh, infrastructure that has been asked uh, uh, by the local municipalities, as the Premier said, they have come to us, asked us to expedite uh, these proposals through MZOs, and we're doing that after they have done that, Mr. Speaker. It is good policy, it, uh, it makes sense, and we will, as the Premier said, continue to do that uh, uh, to the benefit of the people of the province of Ontario. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, we can all agree that in the crisis that we find ourselves in, you know, there are some important decisions, swift decisions that are required to address the dire needs that have been exposed. However, cutting both the public and experts out of the process is not in the interest of Ontarians. When it comes to ensuring we make decisions that will not impact negatively the future of our children. The provincial policy statement was developed with a vision, with the future generations in mind. 
Yet the government is deciding today that the provincial policy statement is no longer, no longer important, giving itself the power to allow for the destruction of protected farmlands, wetlands, and natural features. So what kind of message is the government sending to our youth? When speaking about the removal of the requirements to comply with the PPS, the Minister of Municipal Affairs has said, quote, there cannot be unnecessary barriers put Question. forward, end of quote. Schedule 3 of Bill 257 shows that this government believes protecting the environment is an unnecessary barrier that needs to be overcome in the name of development. So how can the minister justify Schedule 3 and put... Thank you very much. Government House Leader. Uh, again, I think I would uh, uh, thank the member for. Uh, I, I truly thank you for her question, uh, but I think I would uh, uh, disagree with her. Obviously, the env environment remains uh, uh, extraordinarily important. Again, this is the government that brought in the Oak Ridges Marine. This is the government that created the Ministry of uh, uh, of Environment, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Uh, when you're talking about MZOs, they are informed by uh, local municipalities, which have uh, approached the the, uh, the government uh, in order to expedite important infrastructure in the area. That does not mean that we set aside environmental considerations, but. Mr. Speaker, we have heard for months and for years that the environment and the economy can work together. And in every instance where this government has shown that we can protect the environment, we can advance the economy, something that was sold to us by the, the, federal, uh, by the federal Liberals and by the Liberals opposite, every time we've shown that we can do that, Spons? they have systematically turned their backs on both the environment and the economy. We can do both, and we've shown through this that we can and we will. Next question. Next again, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Speaker, a question to the Minister of Energy, Northern Development of Mines and Indigenous Affairs. Uh, yesterday marked the beginning of uh, PDAC. That's the world's premier mineral exploration and mining conventions held right here in Toronto. Typically, the uh, Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada would be welcoming representatives from over 100 different countries. I, I know I've certainly attended in the past. However, this year, because of COVID-19, the conference has moved online. Attendees can join from anywhere around the world. Samantha Espley, president of the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum, recently noted, and I quote, Ontario's mining industry is an instrumental component of the economic strength of Canada, and the pandemic has highlighted the essential nature of the industry. Speaker, my question, Will the government please tell this House how we're supporting the mining sector and reducing barriers with respect to mining exploration? <clears throat> member for Peterborough Florida. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Haldeman Norfolk for his uh, question. As an industry providing materials that are at the front end of our health care, manufacturing, and supply chains, mining was deemed essential by our government and has operated throughout COVID-19. From the very beginning of the pandemic, Ontario's mining operations have made sure that they've had a commitment to protect the health and well-being of all of their workers, their families, and the adjacent communities. It's important for our government to support the mining companies that operate in this province and create good jobs that boost the local economy across the northern Ontario. We'd like to thank the mining sector for the determination throughout this pandemic in keeping their employees safe over the past year. Through the Better for People, Smarter for Business Act, our government has cut red tape, found efficiencies, supporting Response. the mining industry and exploration, and supporting over 75,000 jobs in Ontario. These changes will modernize the, an, the online mining staking system and address gaps in the queue. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker. I very much appreciate that uh, response to my question. And it is encouraging to hear that our government is remaining active and remaining engaged in keeping Ontario open for business and open for jobs as we continue to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. As we know, Ontario is home to some of the top producing mines and more will be opening soon. Despite the pandemic, it's been a monumental year as IM Gold's Cote Gold project and Argano Gold's Magino project were the latest to be given the green light to start construction. Speaker, we know that it's people who make mines, not governments. Projects like these will create thousands of quality jobs to not only create the site, but also thousands of jobs to staff the site once it's operational. 
My question, Speaker, will the government please tell us question. what other tools are available for miners in Ontario to make doing business easier? Again, the member for Peterborough Ford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And even during COVID, we have been uh, launching new products specifically for the mining industry. The Ontario Geological Surf Survey focus is Ontario's new innovative online geoscience tool. It merges all of the historical information that we have on exploration into an easy format that anyone can use. It is a free, publicly accessible tool that allows all parties, from Indigenous communities to exploration companies and prospectors, to have access to all of the same information. Now more than ever, our government is committed to ensuring that we support ongoing prosperity of our province, mineral exploration, and prospecting industry. The OGFS Focus Tool is a state-of-the-art, customer-focused product that will further solidify Ontario's position as a leader Response. in global jurisdiction in mineral exploration and production. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Small business owners in Ontario are terrified that they are not going to survive this pandemic. And, as you are likely aware, they are struggling to access the Ontario Small Business Grant, which, although welcome, is minuscule compared to need and excludes more businesses than it includes. Mohammed, who owns a Jiffy Grill in Hastings, Lennox and Addington, has grown increasingly frustrated. According to the government website, approved businesses were to receive payment in about 10 business days. He applied on January 29th, and finally, late on Sunday night and 38 days after he applied, he found out that he was approved, but he has not yet received his money. This is after five requests for information from our office to the ministry. We've been told that the wait list has grown to over 100,000 applicants and processing times have slowed to a crawl. Can the minister explain why Mohammed and others are being left on a wait list so long when the nature of this situation is so urgent. The member for Flamborough Glanbrook in parliamentary system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government recognizes that small businesses have been hit hard because of the measures that we put in place to ensure that Ontarians remain safe. But, Mr. Speaker, that is why we launched the small business program, the Ontario Small Business Support Grant. And it, Mr. Speaker, is providing a minimum of $10,000, a maximum of $20,000 to eligible small businesses that were forced to close or significantly restrict their services. And, Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud to say that to date we have been able to approve grants for 90,000 small businesses across Ontario, and we have made almost $1.3 billion in payments so far. Eligible small businesses Response. that are expected to experience a minimum 20 per cent decline in revenue may qualify for this grant, and they can use that money any way they see fit. Thank you, Speaker. And let's take a moment to talk about that eligibility. The grant is for businesses that were affected by the closures in December, excluding the large number of businesses that were actually forced to close in earlier lockdowns. In other words, it excludes those who have been the, hit the hardest and longest by public health measures. The program criteria excludes many seemingly arbitrarily. Much like the failed provincial commercial rent subsidy, this program seems to be an attempt to say, look, we're helping when in reality, designing a program that obligates the government to help as few businesses as absolutely possible. As the CFIB pointed out, Ontario's small businesses are struggling more than other provinces. Here, the average COVID-related small business debt is almost 20 per cent higher than the national average. Every penny of Mohammed's grant will go towards his federal relief loans. Loans are incurring hundreds of dollars Question. in late fees and interest due to the uncertainty around the delivery of this business grant. It is clear that more needs to be done, Speaker. Will the government right now commit to expanding the criteria, increasing the funding level, and renewing the grant for another round? Thank you very much. Parliamentary assistant to respond. 
Speaker, and I, I want to say, Mr. Speaker, that I'm proud of the work that our government has done. I have worked with small business owners in my riding of Flamborough, Glanbrook, and right across the city of Hamilton, who have reached out to me, and they were grateful. They found that this money was was a, a life-saving measure for them. I've worked with businesses right across the province in northern Ontario. Sometimes they didn't realize that they were eligible, but we worked with them and they were able to gain access to these grants. And not only is it, our businesses eligible to apply for the Small Business Support Grant, but Mr. Order. Speaker, there are other grants, and I would encourage them to apply for the $1,000 Main Street Relief Grant for PPE, the Digital Main Street uh, program to help businesses go online and, and transition to a digital process, the property tax and energy rebates, and mental health supports Response. available to all small businesses. Visit Ontario.ca backsplash uh, slash COVID support to apply. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Premier. Last October, the government's regulations for stages one, two, and three of the lockdown under the general compliance sections, mandates that masks be worn for anyone over the age of two. This regulatory policy has been in place for months now. Can the government tell us whether it has any data that proves whether mandating that children three, four, and five years of age wearing masks has resulted in a decline in COVID-19 positive reported cases? Thank you, the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Uh, we know uh, through the recommendations made by Dr. Williams, our Chief Medical Officer of Health, as well as the Preventive Measures Table, a um, number of public health experts have recommended that masks be worn to prevent transmission of COVID-19. And we are following, it's important, even as people receive their first dose of the vaccine, we still need to follow those public health measures to keep Ontarians safe and healthy, and that includes keeping a physical distance, wearing a mask uh, when indoors, wearing um, frequent hand washing and the other provisions until all Ontarians who want to receive a vaccine have received both doses of those vaccines that require two doses. Johnson & Johnson is different and only requires one, but the mask wearing is going to continue to be important for some Response. months yet. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it appears the government has no such proof, data, or facts to support mandating children the ages of three or four to wear masks. Even the World Health Organization states in its official position, children under the ages of five should not be required to wear masks. This is based on the safety and overall interest of the child and their capacity to use the mask appropriately. Why in this instance, when it comes to children under five years of age that wearing masks, does this government have a requirement that is crueler than what the WHO recommends? What science is the regulation based on? Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, these are the rec recommendations that we have received from Dr. Williams and all of the other public health experts who are advising us. And it, it is remarkable how children are adapting to wearing a mask, that they are wearing them at very young ages. It don't seem to be uh, suffering from cruelty, as the member has suggested, but we all need to follow these public health measures to make sure that all Ontarians are safe and healthy until everyone who wants to receive a vaccine has received those two doses. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The outbreak at Hamilton Wentworth Detention Centre is only getting worse. Right now, there are 63 cases of COVID-19 at the jail, making it the worst outbreak in Hamilton. Workers, inmates, and families say that they need better communication, transparency, and a real strategy to end the outbreak. Can the Premier tell us why he's allowed the situation to get so bad and what he's doing to help workers, inmates, and their families at the Hamilton Wentworth Detention Centre get through this horrible outbreak? The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Speaker. You know, I think we all appreciate and understand when there is a COVID outbreak how challenging it is for friends and family, which frankly is why we must continue to hear, adhere to and respect the health advice. Specifically related to the Hamilton Wentworth Corrections Centre, we are working directly with the health 
the Hamilton Public Health Unit. Uh, they are ensuring that we have all of the information and we are sharing that with our uh, staff, correction staff. They are doing an exceptional job during challenging times. We know that when there are uh, positivity rates in the communities, it travels. It travels into our long-term care homes, it travels into our hospitals, and yes, it travels into our corrections facilities. So um, I think at the end of the day, what it reinforces is how critically important it is that we continue to Response. respect and adhere to the health advice. Thank you. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. The Hamilton Wentworth Detention Centre is just the latest correctional facility to suffer an outbreak. Across Ontario, detention centres have faced outbreak after outbreak after outbreak. This government's failure to safeguard staff and inmates from COVID-19 are being felt everywhere. In Hamilton, families are saying that the inmates and their families are being kept in the dark about the response and that it is growing frustration, mistrust, and concern about the conditions inside. These families are desperately demonstrating outside the jail in protest to this situation. Why has the government allowed this situation to worsen, and when will it start listening to families and workers? The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Speaker. So, as the member opposite knows, I trust, when uh, new intakes are received in our corrections facilities, uh, those individuals are offered a test and they are self-isolated from the rest of the community uh, for 14 days to make sure that we are not spreading uh, COVID unnecessarily. Um, you know, again, I have to say that the work that our corrections officers, the work uh, that is happening within those facilities uh, continues. Yes, it is challenging in congregate settings, which frankly is one of the very important reasons why we have said congregate settings need to get the vaccines as soon as the supply is here. We are putting that work in place. Uh, in fact, the Kenora Jail has started to vaccinate their uh, corrections officers uh, last week. So we are Response. continuing to do that work. I am working, as I said, directly with the Hamilton Public Health Unit, and we will continue to ensure that staff, family, and inmates are protected. Thank you. The next question, the member for Orléans. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as a result of new SPIF regulations that came into effect on January 1st, dump truck operators have been forced into extreme financial difficulty, especially now during the pandemic. These regulations require that trucks manufactured prior to 2011 undergo expensive retrofits of between $20,000 and $40,000. The average lifespan for a dump truck is 20 to 25 years, so a $40,000 retrofit uh, near the end of its life is simply beyond the reach of most independent operators. The ministry has cut deals. The ministry has cut deals for all other affected construction vehicles, permitting their existing vehicles to be grandfathered into the regulations. Mr. Speaker, small dump truck drivers are at risk of losing their jobs. They are at risk of losing their jobs, Mr. Speaker. Will the minister commit to supporting dump truck Question. operators during this challenging time by permitting them to operate closer to the lifespan of their vehicles? Uh, as they have done with all other affected trucks. Thank you. To reply, the government has a figure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I know this is a regulation that has been uh, on the books for a significant amount of time, if I'm not mistaken, brought in by the previous Liberal government. Uh, uh, I think it really underscores just how bad a government uh, that uh, the previous Liberal government was, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this, is a, this is a former government and an opposition party right now that, if they had their way, would close down construction altogether, putting all of these dump truck operators uh, out of work. We had an opportunity just in this House last week to show our support for hundreds of thousands of jobs across this province. The Liberals decided when it came to line five to stay home sit down and do nothing mr speaker when it comes to supporting jobs when it comes to supporting jobs in construction in in uh, in uh, uh, in resource development mr speaker they can count on the progressive conservative party of ontario to do the right thing especially those dump truck drivers who are so important to our economy and because of the investments we're making in transit Response. transportation they will be busy for many many years to come mr speaker I'm going to remind members you can't make reference to the absence of any member. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad the government's committed to supporting dump truck drivers. They'll be surprised, though, because the government has yet to meet with them after months of requesting these meetings. The government brought these regulations into force 
in the middle of a pandemic, a pandemic that has affected the construction industry as much, if not more, than many other sectors, Mr. Speaker. In fact, I'm glad the, the House Leader mentioned the Liberal record. It was Stephen Del Duca, as Minister of Transportation, who committed to open and transparent consultations with the dump truck industry in 2016, Mr. Speaker. But at their first opportunity, at their first opportunity, this government decided to target dump truck drivers and bring these regulations into force in the middle of a pandemic. Question. Mr. Speaker, will the government commit? Order. Will the government commit to meeting with the industry to hammer out a deal to ensure that these dump truck drivers don't lose their business? Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that I've certainly met with representatives of the dump truck industry as a number of members from this caucus, but talking about Stephen Del Duca, a member who, uh, a leader who decided to build a pool in his backyard against all of the recommendations, he illegally build a pool in his backyard, and this is the gentleman that this person brings to this House Order. to bring forward, a Minister of Transportation who, listened, who forgot to listen to any of the advice, ignored the advice of his officials and decided, well, I'm going to build a GO train station where it's convenient for me, Mr. Speaker. We will take no lessons from Stephen Del Duca when it comes to being ethical, Mr. Speaker. The members opposite had the opportunity to support resource. They had this opportunity to support thousands of jobs. The NDP, thankfully, Mr. Speaker, after 50 years of ideologically blocking pipelines, voted Response. with us, Mr. Speaker, voted to save those jobs. The Liberals voted against those jobs, voted against the environment, voted against the economy, Mr. Speaker. We'll take no lessons from Stephen Del Duca on building. Thank you. The next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoba. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Whereas the only bilingual judge in the district of Algoma retired, the government decided to replace him by a unilingual anglophone judge. So francophones in Algoma have no judge in order to preside over their uh, procedures. This is a very disappointing decision for the francophone community that sees its access to justice in French reduced once again. Will the government come back on this decision and guarantee that there be at least one bilingual judge in the district of Algoma? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise and, and talk a little bit about some of the great work that we're doing with our French communities, our Francophone communities across Ontario. As of the, the bill that's in front of the House now, the ability to file uh, civil forms and family forms uh, in any courthouse anywhere in Ontario, there are a whole string of things that we're doing. Uh, when it comes to judicial uh, appointments and, and judicial uh, uh, administration, that's really part of the independence of the courts. And so. Uh, it is something I, I hear. I hear the member opposite and his concern for his area. Uh, I will undertake to have that conversation uh, to raise the issue with with the Chief Justice of Ontario. But I will respect the independence of the judiciary to administer their judges as they see uh, as they see fit. But I will note it for the Chief Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. We have now several deferred votes, the first being a deferred vote on Government Order No. 48. On March 8, 2021, Mr. Calandra moved concurrence and supply for the Ministry of Long-Term Care, including supplementaries. The bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes. I'll ask the clerks to prepare the lobbies.